Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to walk you through ideation process and kind of how things go in your mind and when you're designing stuff, where you start and then when you kind of end up. It'll be high level. It wouldn't be a lot of examples because I wanted to kind of walk through the process mostly and not just show you a bunch of examples because there's so many YouTube videos out there of makers that build stuff. And they kind of go through a similar process. And this is more going to be um, how you go through this process if you're doing a hobby or DIY or learning a new skill versus a professional level like what engineers do at their day-to-day -day job. And I will touch on those and kind of compare both um, throughout the presentation and at the end, just to give you a little bit of idea what's the benefits of the one versus the other and kind of the main differences. And then it will uh, tie nicely into what you guys just saw about uh, arm shape, which is uh, the cat part of actually designing something. So I just wanted to whet your appetite with this picture. I actually found just my normal browsing of YouTube. Uh, the Hacksmith, if you guys have heard of him, they're trying to build the loader out of uh, Alien. So this kind of their sketch and their idea behind the design. So they started with the basic idea and designed this in CAD and now they're building it. And uh, this is what you can power with your imagination. You can start with this crazy idea of the concept from a movie and go to this. So I'll start the presentation with just introduction. So we're gonna talk about from an idea to a prototype, what the steps are. Uh, my name is Milan Petkov, and uh, just the background of why am I giving this presentation. I'm actually not an engineer, but you guys understand why I'm uh, talking to you in a second. I have a lot of hands-on experience. So my name is pronounced Milan. I know I have to say out there that because a lot of people have a hard time. They're expecting different pronunciation, so I like to start that way if you guys want to address me later. So I started with getting a bachelor's degree in marketing, and then I got a master's degree in marketing. I started in the States, then I did mine in Denmark, uh, my master's. And then after that, I actually went and worked in a tobacco factory in the Middle East, uh, an hour away from Dubai, as the assistant equipment director. So I was doing a lot of stuff that had to do with uh, equipment, installing new equipment, talking to suppliers, uh, building drawings of where the equipment will physically sit in the factory, moving around models in virtual space before we started moving stuff on the floor. And I got more interested into it and decided to become an engineer because two degrees is just not enough. I figured I'll round it to a three degrees. So I went to engineering school or at least started to, uh, went back to Minnesota. And then I realized it's nearly impossible to go to engineering school full-time and work full-time. So um, I kind of dropped that. And uh, in the process though, I decided to become a maintenance mechanic and get as much hands-on experience with equipment and maintaining equipment as I could while I was going to school for engineering and not just Learn, learn the theory, but actually get my hands on equipment. So um, I worked as a maintenance mechanic and apprentice electrician. This was a plastics factory. They would make a plastic film um, used in different applications. And then I moved back to Seattle and worked as an Amazon contractor maintaining their conveyor belts in their uh, distribution center. And because it was night shift, I couldn't really do more than six month, 12 hour shifts, that was enough. So I moved to another plastic manufacturing company. They also made plastic film, but this one was actually PVC versus uh, the normal extruding of uh, pallets. So different materials, kind of similar equipment. And from there, I actually moved to uh, industrial mechanic at Genie, the ones that make scissor lifts in uh, Redmond. And I worked on all sorts of equipment there, plasma cutters, laser cutters, custom build equipment. Um, there's just built in house. Uh, worked on a lot of uh, electronics and building panels and hydraulics, pneumatics, pretty much anything you can think of in that 
in the building I touch plumbing and installing electrical and after all that experience and me not becoming an engineer I realized that I need to move up as a career choice and not keep wrenching on stuff and so I finally joined Boeing as a maintenance analyst which means I'm helping out the guys that um, fix the equipment that builds the aircraft and I help them out with uh, scheduling preventive maintenance helping them uh, lead workshops of solving problems that they have and pretty much working with other teams that work with the mechanics that fix the equipment to make sure we continue building aircraft um, and maintain the equipment that builds the aircraft. So even though I'm not an engineer, I have a lot of hands-on experience and I've always been interested in building stuff. And this is why I'm presenting to you guys today. So the way the process usually starts, um, we're going to look at kind of the hobby level or the DIY level, or in your guys' case, it's going to be the learning level. You're learning a new skill. And this is kind of how I started when I was young. I would take apart stuff myself and want to figure out how it works and eventually become so passionate about it. I pursue it as a career and I'm still in it, even though I'm not an engineer. I still do a lot of uh, technical stuff. So the way the process starts is it's usually iterative, which means you start from some idea you have and then you keep building on it. And then you continuously improve the idea as you go through the different build stages. And then it continuously evolves, uh, evolves over time. It can evolve just by you thinking about it from a different perspective in your head or you start drawing it and you figure out things don't don't fit right or you actually build it and it doesn't work right so um, this is what i'm going to cover and kind of show you what the steps are so you start with an idea and you want to build something you find a need that there's a gadget that can serve that need or in this case you're building a robot and you decide that the robot has to have some function but you don't necessarily have the parts. Maybe you need to build some sprockets that mesh together to move something, or you need a scoop or whatever it is. And you have the idea and you have to start building it, but you don't know where to start. So the best way to start building anything is start imagining it, kind of picture it in your head, what it's gonna look like. And this is where you actually build it for the first time. You build it in your head and kind of imagine it in space and uh, you think of what it should look like. And it can be very vague and not even a real product. And you start kind of picturing in your head and uh, you do have to follow some rules. You can just um, start building it in your head completely um, disconnected from physical world. So you kind of have to have enough understanding of how things work in order to um, start imagining it. But it's okay even if it doesn't follow um, the physical world just yet, it's still in your head. But um, you still have to kind of start imagining it, think what, what you want it to do, even if it's far-fetched. Um, it, you have to start building it in your head, no matter what. Then you start sketching the idea. And then you hand draw it on a piece of paper just so you can start of uh, conceptualizing it and bringing it to life. And it's more than just the uh, image in your mind. Now it's something more physical. You can see it. And this is where you actually build it for the second time because now you're actually start thinking about dimensions, start thinking of what's attached to what. And it can be something simple or something very complicated. Um, but usually the sketch is very high level. It will just kind of give it some shape. And uh, the next step is you actually start drafting it. And we're not talking about AutoCAD. We're talking about actually using a ruler, using some, uh, using a pencil so it can erase things, using uh, some compasses, uh, things like that. And so far, you're doing this mostly mechanically. You're not thinking about it. You just kind of draw it out. And you don't waste your time in CAD where you have to think about each command, which takes a lot of time, especially if you're not practiced. Then this is why it's, it's uh, very important to start uh, when you're new to this, to start doing this by hand, because you can get your ideas quicker um, 
to real life, to something real without having to struggle with the software until you get better at the process and then you move to CAD. So you start dr drawing it, you can draw it to scale, you can uh, be one to two. So if it's, uh, let's say if it's 10 feet, but you don't really have 10 foot pages to be able to fit your idea, maybe you're drawing a door. Maybe you wanna, instead of doing it at 10 feet, you draw it at 10 inches. So that's, um, you scale it down so it actually fits your paper but it's more than just a concept that you hand drew. Now you're starting to look at dimensions. And this is where you actually build it for the third time. And then you make a template. It can be a piece of paper that you actually make it, um, here you actually transfer it. Uh, you can make it to scale if you're just testing something or you can start building a, the full size thing you're building. If it's a sprocket, you can actually draw it out to what it's supposed to be on a piece of paper can be either sticky back or you can uh, use a uh, glue stick and then actually you build it for the fifth time before you stick it to some material. Maybe it's uh, plywood, maybe it's uh, fiberglass, maybe it's uh, something else, maybe it's steel or aluminum, kind of whatever you, you're thinking of building this out of. And you can start doing um, hand tools here or some uh, hand power tools to build it. This is where you actually build it for the fifth time and final time before you actually have a real prototype. And you actually have a physical product from that idea that you just imagined to something you can try it out. Um, and you start testing it and you start testing all your assumptions in your head. It was something that um, really didn't necessarily had to follow the physical world out there when it was in your head. And you had to be more and more constrained as you started building it because now it has to function in the real world. So this is where you start testing your assumptions. You start testing different geometries. Would it actually work together the way I designed it? Maybe triangular spokes on your sprocket are not the best option. Maybe they need to be a little bit more rounded. Uh, maybe you wanna try different materials. Uh, uh, aluminum, maybe it's too soft. Maybe we need to go to steel so it doesn't wear out as much. Or maybe we need to save on weight. So we need to go with maybe wood versus steel or we go with plexiglass because it's still pretty durable but it's lighter than the steel. And then you start thinking of the operating conditions. Is, uh, is it gonna be running in cold weather? If it's uh, plexiglass, it gets cold and brittle. Maybe it's running too hot um, condition. So this is where you test all your assumptions you had and actually start running whatever it is. If it's a part or if it's a whole, um, whole thing, you start testing it, see if it really works. And then you start finding interferences, going back to the geometry, see if things actually move the way you imagined it. Maybe there's a bolt in the way that you didn't think about in the beginning and then you just had to fasten things and now the bolt is interfering. Maybe you need to move it um, somewhere else or think of maybe welding instead of bolting it. Um, and then find breaking points, find how this operates. Like you keep moving it beyond the normal operating conditions and see if it breaks. Um, kind of goes back to testing the material, see if the material will actually last for what you need it to do. And this is where you get the real thing and start playing uh, with it. And then the professional level differs a little bit. It's more what we would think about as engineering level, what engineers do for a living. And this is where the CAD and the CAM software comes in. CAD is computer aided drafting. So all that I talked about, you'll just kind of start doing it on the computer. And CAM is kind of the next step computer aided manufacturing which is you take that drawing and you translate it into some code that the machine can follow and uh, either cut, um, cut it on a mill, do it on a lathe, maybe it's a CNC, water jet or whatever the machine is. There are all these steps that you have to do in order to manufacture your part or whatever you've designed. The, if it's just a single part or a sprocket, it's straight, uh, sprocket, it's a straightforward design. If you have a design for a whole machine, maybe there's a bunch of different drawings behind. You have to manufacture every single part and you go through this process that I described for every single thing. Um, CAD and CAM or engineering level requires rigorous training. It's not something you can jump in right away. And I know some of you might be a little bit overwhelmed because you 
have to jump in on shape and you're trying to figure out mostly what the software is about versus actually what you have in your idea and you kind of get overwhelmed by the software and you kind of drop your idea. And this is why I wanted to talk to you guys of doing this by hand. Try it out, sketch it out on a piece of paper, see what it is. Once you have a good idea of what you want to build, then jump into the software, then you figure it out. It's a lot easier to learn something when you have an idea behind it versus if you're trying to um, learn it without knowing what you want to do with it. it it's much easier to learn something when you have your end goal in mind. Um, you have to have an engineer understanding um, for the hand drawing and doing this manually, you do as well, but um, the engineering understanding comes more, it's more important here. It's uh, materials, it's different equipment, different software. You have to know drafting practices. Uh, you can draft something for yourself and draw it out and it's great, but if you give this drawing to a machine shop, for example, or for somebody that needs to do something else for you, you have to know how to measure things. You need to hold the dimension and you need to know what the limitations of the equipment is. Um, you need to give them enough information so they can build the part that you need. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you're an engineer and you send out a part to a machine shop, the guy that's manufacturing your part that's running the machine might not be an engineer and uh, if or maybe he needs to go into the CAD, CAD software and do all the measurements get a starting point of the machine and if you don't give them all that it's going to be extra work which it's an, essentially they're going to charge you for it and it's going to make your part a lot more expensive or they would just say sorry i don't have the dimensions i can make part for you um, also, you need to understand machine best practices because machines are different. Some have limitations of what they can do. Um, if you need more axis uh, machining, like five axis is different than a three axis machine. Also, you need to understand what the machines can manufacture um, as materials, their speeds and feeds. Um, there's different parameters based on the equipment and uh, material you're using. And, are you actually running a lathe or a mill or a, a laser or a plasma cutter? It, it, there's all these considerations you need to do in order to manufacture a part. And then it all requires a lot of practice, not just the CAD and CAM software, but requires practice through going to school, doing a lot of math, um, understanding what the principles of what you're doing are there stress testing, and there's a lot of things that go into becoming an engineer and doing this at a professional level, which you can avoid if you want to just try out something and learn from um, trial and error. You don't really have to go through all this, which is the benefit of doing it by hand. You can figure things out on your own without having to jump into CAD at all. And then there's a high initial cost. CAD software can be very expensive. Um, you guys are lucky you can get the student version. But if you're looking at any of these softwares, they start at four or $5,000 and going up from there, depending on what modules you add and plugins. And uh, if you want to do stress testing and every single part that you add to it and you want to do more with it, it usually costs money. And for big companies that this is their their normal business, it's an investment, but if you want to do this on your own, it's a very, very high cost. And it takes a lot longer to draw anything, especially if you want to learn something, just because it you have to think about the command. Okay, I want to draw a line. You can't just take a pencil and draw a line. You have to understand what the command is, where you click first, click second, how you connect lines. So you have to think about the, the commands, which Going back to takes a lot of practice, you have to make it more of a muscle memory versus thinking of every command. There are tools that do help with that. There's drawing pads that you take a pen and you can draw stuff. So you actually don't have to do it with a mouse and it's a little bit more intuitive drawing, um, but it still takes some practice and some muscle memory in order to do it um, fast and efficient. Um, the benefit you can go back and edit quickly. If you have an idea and you want to try something else, you just save a copy of the file, go back, delete something, redraw it, 
then you can do multiple design ideas fairly quickly by going back, removing parts or slightly changing them. And you can have several designs whipped out quickly without having to start over um, on anything on paper. Like paper, you have to draw every element from the beginning. So this is where most engineering companies are. They don't start with a fresh idea out of the, um, out of the gate. Mostly they have um, something that they're working on. For example, in Boeing, if they are designing a new aircraft, they start with a basic shape of a wing, for example, and they know what wings need to have, what shapes work, what they don't. Um, they change one element here and there. They don't start from the ground up building a whole new wind, whole new wing. And then um, there's a lot of guys working on different pieces of, uh, of the wing. There's uh, one engineer might work on just a bracket for two or three weeks or maybe even longer. There's a lot of time put behind it to make sure it's designed right and it's, uh, it's going to function right. And then get uh, stress tested on the software. Then eventually everything comes to um, actual wing and that gets tested. So you can see why it takes a lot of time to do it in CAD, but you can't, if you were doing it, um, like say 60s, 70s, even in the 80s when they were doing this all this by hand, so it took even longer. But getting into um, learning or just doing something one-off for yourself, it's going to be way quicker than CAD. And as I said, it usually don't start from scratch. You already have something you're working on, unless you're a new company and you start redesigning a product from. You have a completely new idea or a completely new product. Um, you usually don't start every time you have a new project uh, from the ground up. You, you start with something. You, you start with an older project. You can use it as a template or you can use it as a guide and uh, you go from there. So the beauty of it is you can, again, change something quickly on the fly and test it out without having to redraw it again. <clears throat> So that's kind of what I have for you guys. Um, I know it's a lot of um, high level stuff. I didn't want to use uh, a lot of examples because there's so many videos out there on YouTube. There's so many makers that go through this process. They might not um, all go through every step on video or explain every step when they say how they're doing things, but this is the basic uh, process you would go through building anything and designing anything. There's so many uh, makers out there and some of them are very famous and in, uh, in YouTube, some of them are up and coming, but any process, if it's a van conversion or somebody has an idea of how to convert an old uh, suitcase into something else, kind of starts from the same thing. You start with a drawing, start with the idea, start with the drawing, test it out, um, cut, cut it out of easier to, um, to handle material, you usually start with wood, kind of build it together, see what it looks like. Then you build it out of steel or aluminum because it's cheaper and it's easier. And then you just test it out. If it doesn't work, then you try something else. So that's kind of how the process is. Even for engineers, they go through the same thing. It just takes a lot longer for stress testing, drawing it out. And it's a lot more complicated than simple projects as well. A lot of different parts. Any questions? Um, we can wait a couple, like two minutes to see if any questions pop sure. up. Sure, no problem. But, um, would you be willing to stay afterwards for like 15 minutes in the- Yeah, no problem. Yeah. I wanted to kind of give everybody a quick overview of what the process is and uh, give everybody more chance to ask questions for specific applications or something more specific. Yeah, I think- that's... I just want to show you one last thing. That's just one of the books I got. Oh, of course, it's not showing very well because of my camera. But this is uh, just a machining book. It's 800 plus pages. A third of it is on uh, manual mill and lane, and the rest of it is for CNC. And that's just how to operate it. That's not how to design anything. That just teaches you about different bits and 
rake angles and fades and speeds. And that's just after you have an idea what the machine shop does. So there's a lot of knowledge you need to do in order to do all this if you want to do everything. This is why usually it's not one person that starts with the design, draws all the design and then runs the machine because there's a lot of steps. There are guys who do all this, but they're usually hobbyists, small shops. But if you're doing it at an industrial scale, it's usually a lot of people involved because it's just a lot of a lot of knowledge and a lot of different uh, factors that it's really hard for one person to know and fit everything in their head and being able to do it. A lot of man hours as well. Yeah. Um, so we had a, a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, they said great presentation. Um, you, you mentioned that beginners often get bogged down with mechanics or, of software, um, like learning how to use it instead of actually developing their idea. So uh, how would you suggest they um, make sure they don't get caught up in the software and focus on their actual idea? The best thing is to actually have an idea when you're learning a software. Let's say you want to design a sprocket for a robot. And then as you're doing the modules and the tutorials, think about how that will apply to your sprocket that you're trying to design. Um, don't just go and learn the tutorials because they're very much in a vacuum that way. They're like, oh, you, you draw an arc this way and then you draw straight here and you wanna join these two pieces and you're like, great, but that doesn't really fit into how I, I wanna build this. So if you have a part in mind that you wanna build, it's a lot uh, easier to understand what the commands do and how they come together in order for draw a part. Um, I would start with drawing things by hand and just seeing how things work on paper before I even jump into um, the CAD software. I have an example here. I had an idea of building this frame. I wanna build a frame out of uh, 8020 to put some pegboard to organize my video gear. But before I even wasted uh, hours on end and, and CAD, I drew out what the basic design is, looked at what my dimensions have to be, and then I drew some dimensions so I can even see if it, if it's even worth doing it cat and uh, I can figure out how to build this without even going into cat. Um, so it's very helpful to even draw it all because sometimes you can, uh, for example, uh, on this piece, hope you guys can see it. The triangles right here are actual brackets that hold the 8020, uh, which is uh, extruded aluminum. I kept counting in my head and I kept thinking I need eight of them. If you count, there's four here, one, and this is the side view. So down here for the legs, you need two more. So I need six. But in my head, I kept thinking, all right, I need to order eight. So I kept putting eight in my uh, shopping basket to figure out how many parts I need and see how much this will cost. And then as soon as I drew it, I'm like, oh, wait, I don't need eight. I just need six. So until you put it on paper and see what it looks like, you can be um, stuck trying to design it. It's the same thing with, uh, with the CAD software. If you don't, if you have this drawing on paper, it's a lot easier to dimension things and see, oh, I need, I need this to be 36 inches wide, but then I have these uh, to uh, subtract some of the actual material. So I have 36 overall length. And when you have something like that, it's a lot easier to relate what they're teaching you to building something versus being very abstract. And you draw a line this way, you draw an arc that way, you connect them. But when you have an idea in your head, it might be easier for you to just keep going through the modules. I know it takes some time as well. Um, take a break. If you've been sitting in front of the computer watching videos for an hour and you feel like you're not paying attention anymore, which happens to all of us, take a break. Come back to it in half an hour. Come back to it tomorrow. Just uh, keep persistent. That's also uh, very important because it kind of clicks after you get enough practice with it. When you go through enough of the training and you get enough elements and commands together where you can draw something out, it kind of clicks for you. And then you draw a circle, um, then you add some teeth to it and it's a sprocket. And you're like, oh, wait, well, if that's how that works, can I actually build something else? So it's persistence, but also having an idea in your head. And the so just to clarify, softwares are a little bit different where their commands work a little bit different. 
but the basic principle behind all the software is, is very similar. You, you draw and design things the same way. Um, I would recommend going and looking how to design things on paper if you guys find some books on this. And um, first look at that part before you look at the software because it's like any other software. You jump on one software, you learn the commands, but then you switch to a different software. Um, I can give you an example for video editing. If you video edit on Final Cut Pro, which only runs on a Mac, and then you switch to um, the Adobe one, they work slightly different, but they work the same way. The basic principle is there because it's the principle of how you edit video and you just have to adjust a little bit of what the commands are. Um, I'm saying this because you guys asked earlier about Siemens design software versus Onshape. I actually learned AutoCAD first before I learned anything else. And then I started um, learning SolidWorks. Commands are a little bit different. Um, but they all have layers. They all have the same basic principle. So start with the basics of how to draw things and that will also make the software um, a lot less intimidating. I hope that wasn't too long-winded. Uh, no, that was perfect. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, one of them was, what was one of your personal favorite products that you have done? Um, any products that you did when you were young that um, was like an illustrative experience? Um, from your career that could um, kind of connect to this prototyping process? Hmm. Well, for me, really what I enjoyed the most um, was the control systems and designing cabinets and actually building those because that's really what um, makes all the motors, all the gear boxes, everything um, on the machine work together. And before you can program the movement of the machine, you gotta have, kind of have uh, the brain built together. And um, in order to build the proper control box, you need to know what the machine needs to do. You need to know what the components are. Um, and even then you have to lay it out, physically see what the components that are gonna drive this um, in the real world, how big are they gonna be? If you get a control panel, because you have to close it, make sure it's watertight and dustproof and all that and you run electricity, so it has to be sealed from um, hurting somebody, you have to make sure you get a big enough uh, panel um, to fit everything, but not too big because maybe you don't have the footprint. So I really enjoyed working on, on the electrical side of things uh, because it was where you marry the electronics with the mechanical and you have to kind of know everything. You have to understand a little bit of uh, electrical, um, be able to read electrical diagrams, they know all the stuff that needs to be moving on the equipment, like do you have pumps, do you have motors, do you have uh, sensors, where are they going to be, how long is the cable going to be, where are you going to run all this. So that's the part I really enjoyed and a lot of it, it's not really drawing it out, the, the electrical panel you will draw it out so you can um, make the drawing, uh, electrical drawing based on it, get your footprint for the cabinet, but running the cables, nobody really draws this ahead of time because it, you don't know how you're exactly going to route them. You kind of build a, let's say a big duct that you run all the cables, but you don't put on the drawing as an engineer where each hole is going to be for your, for example, all the sensors, they're going to run into that duct, go back to the control panel. And that's up to the guy who's installing this. And I was uh, usually that guy. So you get a lot of freedom of doing um, the final steps of the design because it's it's a concept that somebody drew on paper made sure most things fit but when you're building this if you see that there's interference because they never accounted for a bolt or a bracket or something like that you kind of have to um, solve that problem on the spot and you might have to go back to the engineer and be like i can't do this can we move the this sensor somewhere else is it going to interfere so that's, that's the really interesting part that I had in my experience is the, the controls. And one example I'll give you, I worked when I was in, uh, in the cigarette factory, I worked with uh, the mechanics that came and installed the new machine. There was an electrician, there was a, a mechanic. And they told me the machines are so complicated, there's so much more electronics into them the mechanic has to know some electronics. It has to know what the other guy's doing and vice versa. The electrician is not just running cables. Now he, ne he needs to understand what the mechanical side of things is. 
because the electronics are controlling the mechanical side. Machines used to be a lot more um, mechanical in the past. We didn't have the technology to be able to control it. So everything was hard length. There were gearboxes. One motor can move several different things and they were geared differently because they had to move different speeds. And now it's a lot more uh, simplified. You have, and if you're uh, in the past had to move three different speeds, one thing you have to have uh, reducing gearboxes. And now you just have two, um, three separate motors. Each one has its own controller and then the machine can actually control each one and change the speeds if you need to based on, on your equipment. So it's very interesting to uh, get into engineering nowadays. There's a lot more involvement than what it used to be in the past. And you kind of have to know what you're working with, um, with the other guy, either the guy who's building the equipment or the other engineer that's doing the electrical stuff. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, so one person in the chat is trying to design a device around serving food without any physical contact. Um, how right. should he start his design process? What do you recommend? Um, always go back to where it's going to be used and uh, think about what you're trying to replace. So go and see how the process works now and see what the limitations are. This is part of uh, continuous improvement and the whole Toyota methodology where you don't just assume something sitting in front of a computer and think that's how it works on the production floor or in this case in the cafeteria go and look at how how the food gets served um, think about um, record everything to minute detail like i'm taking the ladle i put it down now i take it up I scoop up three ounces, then I move it 10 inches to the left and I pour it down in the plate. Record every single step in that way. I know it looks a little bit stupid. Maybe you just do a video and then you record it, but the, that will give you a very good idea of how the machine has to work. Because if you're designing a robot and you're thinking, okay, the robot just pours it and then you don't see those little steps. If you record them, it's gonna be a lot easier to then design the robot. Maybe it's just one hand that does the motion. You just need to program the hand to do all the motion. But unless you see um, how it works and what needs it, um, it needs to satisfy, it's gonna be much harder to design it. You're gonna have a lot of assumptions that you have to correct. And that kind of goes back to designing something new that um, you start with a huge list of assumptions. If you're designing something new that you're not even trying to replace a human with a machine, but something completely different, there's so many assumptions you start with. You start with so many prototypes, you test each one, and you see would it actually satisfy what you're trying to do. So in that case, I would say, go look at the process, document it, either do a video so you don't have to um, write very quickly of everything that's going, and then um, go back, look at the video and record each step. Um, also, you can look at sp spaghetti diagramming and it's, um, it's a tool that you record each step. Like um, let's say if you have to turn around, scoop the food and then turn this way, but then you have to move somewhere to go get the new food. And that's part of the process that you have to design. You wanna see how far those steps are and how much movement it is because maybe you're trying to also design um, the movement out, make, uh, make everything much closer together. So if uh, you're trying to avoid human contact, but somebody has to come and replace, the, let's say you're serving soup, the soup um, every 15 minutes, and this is more interaction between people. Maybe you want to put two pots next to each other. So now you have to only replace the soup um, every half an hour, something like that. But without documenting the whole process, you can't really design something that's a good alternative to what you have right now. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think it does a great job. Um, another person asks, are there any limitations to using CAD software? And if there are any limitations, what do you suggest to fill those gaps? Um, they are, and most of them are not the software itself. Um, each software is designed with a very specific purpose, so you might have to get more add-ons. <coughs> Sorry, let me get some water. So each software is designed with a very specific person. You can get more plugins to do different things. 
Um, I mentioned stress testing very uh, a lot during the presentation and stress testing is usually an extra module or completely different software, but usually the limitation is not with the software, but with the knowledge of the people that are using it. I'll give you one example. Um, the designers at Genie, the engineers, when they build a tool that has to, um, a new piece of equipment, because we um, had to build a lot of stuff in house that was very specific. It was nothing really on the market to satisfy what we're trying to achieve. But the way they test if this is actually going to work to be fixed and parts are going to be able to replace, they have a tool in uh, SolidWorks that's just average hand. It's like this. And then they check if you can put your hand in like that. If that's you can do that, the gap is fine. I can get as a mechanic to the back of that machine and unscrew that bolt, but I've never held a tool like that in my life. I hold a tool like this. It's a fist. I have to be able to fit my fist holding the tool, not just the flat hand. So this is where the limitation of the engineers is because they don't talk to the guys who are going to either service the equipment or the guys that are going to be built for the equipment. There's such a concept as a engineer for manufacturability, which is a big deal because you can come up with all these crazy ideas, but it cannot be manufactured physically. And kind of 3D printing is bridging that gap because you can build a lot of complex shapes, but not everything can be 3D printed. You can build uh, 3D print a strong airplane wing, for example. So the gap here is actually having an open communication with the people that are going to service that equipment and the people that are going to build it. I can give you one other example. If you think about fixing a car, if you guys ever worked on cars, you always think, how am I going to get to that? The turbo is fit behind the engine between the firewall and the engine. The only way to get to it, you got to pull the engine out. Why? Well, think about this, the engine and the turbo and everything that comes on the engine it wasn't built in the car. They build the engine, the turbo and everything, they just drop it in the car when they manufacture it. So it was designed for manufacturability, but it wasn't designed for maintenance. So now if you're a mechanic, you charge whoever brings your car to get your turbo replaced several thousand dollars just because the fact they have to pull the engine out. They can't just undo three bolts, drop the turbo, put a new one in. Um, so this is kind of where the gap comes in. It's not the software necessarily, but understanding the other part, how's this going to be manufactured and how this is going to get serviced. And um, in Genie, there was a very good relationship between the mechanics. They're going to either build or service this and the, the engineers who are designing this, they'll come and talk to us and say, hey, do, I'm looking at this thing. Have you ever used this part for that? How does it work? And let's say it's a rail with a linear bearing. And we know what the environment is in the paint booth and they want to use that and we'll be like it will never work one day of painting and they'll be painted on and this machine will not uh, move anymore so this is where usually the gap is not in the design software itself but in the real world and that's what i was talking to you guys in the in the presentation is everything's fine in your head until you start bringing into the real world and then you have to think about physical laws and physics and actually people, ha um, things having mass like bolts um, as fasteners have heads, they stick out. You might not uh, think about it and then they interfere. So this is where the gap comes in. So the more of these details you can draw in your, in your drawing on uh, the bolt heads and all that, it's gonna be easier to um, manufacture later on. I know it's sometimes it's tedious, but sometimes you have to do it in order to have uh, the good design. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question. Do you okay. think CAD is always necessary in creating prototypes and in what like kinds of prototypes is it okay to just go by paper or um, specific drawings? Um, I would say if you're trying to do a quick and dirty, let's try it out, see if it works. Um, you can even go with cardboard. Um, there's a good channel on I, um, I watch. Um, they're modifying uh, Mini. And what they do is they call it a CAD design, but they're joking because it's cardboard aided design. So they just use this uh, thick carb, um, fiber board and they cut everything down to shape to, let's say they're 
building a panel somewhere, but they'll cut it out of cardboard, tape it together, and then flatten it and cut it out of a piece of um, aluminum or steel or whatever it is. And if they have to design this and do all this CAD work, it's going to take them much longer than just going out and uh, tracing something on a template. So that's one example. And I would say CAD is mostly useful when you're trying to manufacture things in bulk. If you're trying to do the same repeatable work, if you're going to do 10,000, a million parts, CAD is great. If you're doing a one-off thing, unless you're doing something extremely complicated that has a lot of moving parts, I probably wouldn't waste my time with CAD. I would just get some cardboard, get some plywood, draw it out on paper. Um, you don't even have to build it to one-on-one -on -one scale. Like let's say if you're building a, a trap door behind the robot and you're thinking, how would this open? Just build it out of cardboard. It doesn't even have to be 20 by 20 inches. Just do it two by two inches and uh, see how that's gonna operate, which way it's gonna open um, and see, is it gonna interfere with the main function of the robot, for example? You don't necessarily have to go all the, do the legwork of, drawing the cat if it's one-off thing um, you can be a lot quicker and uh, do trial and error and that's kind of the best way to learn anything just try it out for yourself try your assumptions out and see if they're correct um, there's a lot of things that go on in your head that you assume but the real world doesn't always work that way i remember when i was studying physics physics ones is the most challenging one because you have to learn everything you think you know about the real world because it doesn't quite function the way you thought. Um, physical laws are kind of weird. So you have to unlearn your experience. So by being able to uh, prototype something quickly out of cardboard or plywood or um, some easier to um, cut or shape materials, you can learn a lot quickly than building everything, spending five hours designing something, then you finally build it and like, well, I just wasted now seven hours of designing and building where you can just build it in an hour and say, okay, this is not working. You learn everything you can and now you design it if you're gonna make it more of a production part. All right, thank you I so hope, much. I hope that answers that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess that concludes the Q&A part. Um, Thank you, Millen, so much for coming out and talking with us. And of course. Um, if you guys have any questions um, with your actual designs, feel free to ping one of us, and I will direct the question to Millen. Yep, I'm one of the mentors to the team. So if you guys need any help, uh, you can reach out to me or through any of the other uh, leaders of the team, and we can help you out, look at some ideas. And it's kind of why I joined the team.